Roll for Crit presents how to play Gloomhaven in five minutes or less or more. Gloomhaven is the massive tabletop role-playing dungeon crawling co-op campaign legacy game that, oh, this is going to take more than five minutes, isn't it? Designed by Isaac Childress and published by Cephalo Fair Games. Since Gloomhaven is a campaign game, you'll probably want to play through an entire campaign with the same group of people. Your goal will be to work together to complete multiple scenarios with various objectives while advancing your character and improving the city of Gloomhaven itself. However, you can also just play any scenario as a standalone game if you'd like. Each player will begin with their own unique character class, mat, tokens, cards, and miniature. Then you'll select a scenario from the scenario book. If you're participating in a campaign, you'll have to make sure that you meet the scenario's requirements before starting. The scenario book will instruct you as to how to set everything up, including which map tiles will be used, how to arrange them, which enemies or tiles will be used, and where they'll go. Players place their miniatures on one of the designated starting spaces, and you're ready to get going. Each player has a set of ability cards which they'll take into their hands. At the start of a round, everyone looks through these cards and chooses two that they'd like to play on their turn, placing them face down in front of them. Each card has a top and a bottom section. Of the two cards you'll play on your turn, you must activate the top section of one and the bottom section of the other. You can't use both abilities listed on one card or the same section on two different cards. You also shouldn't discuss what your cards do with your teammates except in vague terms. At the center of each card is an initiative number that will determine your turn order. When choosing your two cards, you'll designate one as your leading card, which means that you'll want to use that card's number as your personal initiative number for the turn. Once everyone is ready, all players flip their chosen cards simultaneously simultaneously while also indicating which holds their initiative number. Whichever player has the lowest initiative number goes first, followed by the next lowest, and so on until everyone has taken a turn. There will also be enemies in play with their own initiative numbers, but we'll get into their turns later. So on your turn you're taking two actions, one from each card, but what possible actions might these cards actually let you take? Let's talk specifics. First up is movement. A move action allows you to move up to the indicated number of spaces on the board following the hexes on the map. You can move through your own allies, but you can't move through walls, enemies, or obstacle tiles. Jump actions or flying actions are special abilities that allow you to ignore these rules regarding enemies and obstacles. But no matter what, you must always end your movement in an unoccupied space. Next, you can attack enemies. Attacks come in two flavors, melee and ranged. Melee attacks need to be performed on an enemy adjacent to the space you're in. Ranged attacks can be performed from up to a certain number of spaces away from your target as indicated by the card. Ranged attacks also require line of sight, meaning that you can draw a straight line from one corner of your hex to another corner of the target hex without touching any walls. After declaring your attack on a valid target, you'll reveal the top card from your personal attack modifier deck. Each of these attack modifier cards contains a positive or negative number that will either add to or subtract from your initial attack value, meaning you might end up doing more or less damage than you thought you would as a result of this deck. You might also get modifier cards that multiply your damage or that result in a complete miss, in which case nothing happens. After all of that though, you can apply the total damage to your enemy target by placing the appropriate number of damage tokens on the space of the enemy card matching that specific enemy's number. Once they have a number of damage tokens equal to their health value, they're removed from the board and a single money token appears in their place. If an ability gives you advantage on an attack, you draw two modifier cards and use the best one. If you have disadvantage, for example if you're using a ranged attack on a target in an adjacent hex, then you draw two modifiers and use the worse one. Some attacks feature area effects, indicated by a diagram of red hexes. This means that the attack can affect any targets within that arrangement of hexes on the board based on your character's position that they have line of sight to, requiring a new modifier card for each target present. Something else you'll need to be aware of are elemental infusions. This elemental table will help you keep track. If any of your actions feature a symbol matching one of the elements, then using it will result in moving that element token into the strong section of the table. Then later, if you have an action featuring an element symbol with an X through it, that means that you get an extra bonus of some kind if said element is in either the strong or waning sections of the table when you use that action. Elements move one space to the left at the end of each round. A player cannot both infuse and make use of the same element on a single turn. A few other action abilities you might make use of. Shield protects from a certain amount of damage during an attack. 
Retaliate deals a set number of damage to any enemies who attack you from an adjacent hex. Heal recovers a certain amount of your health or an ally's health up to their max health according to their current level. Summon abilities allow you to bring a new ally into the game represented by a summon token with its own stats and abilities. Summon allies take a turn directly before the character who summoned them, always moving and attacking according to their card details. And of course, you can loot. A loot action will allow you to pick up any money or treasure tokens within a certain range. Money you'll count up later. For treasure, you'll reference a table which will tell you what you actually found. Also, you'll automatically loot anything left over in the space where you end your turn, no card required. Some abilities may also give you experience indicated by a number inside of a little star shape. Simply add these experience points to your experience counter every time you successfully carry out one of these actions. If you really don't like any of the actions available to you on your cards, you can always instead opt to use their basic action values to either move to or attack for two. Players also have item cards, which can be used at any time based on the wording of the card. Some items are discarded after use, while others are simply rotated to indicate that they've been used. Certain abilities may later allow you to refresh these items to be used again during the same scenario. So, once you've completed the two actions from your cards, you'll place them in your discard pile, unless they're a one-time effect, as indicated by this symbol, in which case they're removed from the game for that scenario, or they have a persistent effect, as indicated by this symbol, in which case they'll stay out for your reference. But wait, there's still one final thing that you can do on your turn other than playing cards. If you're unable or unwilling to play two cards from your hand, you can instead perform a long rest. A long rest puts you at initiative 99 for the round and doesn't let you perform any of your typical actions. Instead, look at your discarded cards. Choose one of them to get rid of for the rest of the scenario and take the rest back into your hand. You also get to heal two points of damage and refresh any of your used item cards. If you're in a hurry, you can instead perform a short rest, which happens at the end of the round instead of on your turn. A short rest lets you take your discarded cards back into your hand, but instead of choosing a discarded card to get rid of, you have to pick randomly. Although you can take one damage in exchange for picking a second random card if you don't like the first choice. Short rests also don't let you heal or refresh items. But remember, it's not just the players who get to take turns, enemy monsters will also be out and about. Each monster type present in the scenario will have its own deck, and they'll flip a card at the same time that all the players reveal their chosen cards for the turn. Their cards will also feature an initiative number determining their turn order, as well as what actions or special abilities they'll have on their turns. If there are multiple monsters of the same type, they'll have randomly assigned numbers to indicate their turn order from lowest to highest. There are also two categories of each monster type, normal and elite. Elite monsters are stronger and activate before normal ones. Monsters always attempt to move toward and attack the closest target available to them with initiative numbers breaking ties. They will always attempt to avoid traps and move into the most advantageous attack position possible. Then they follow the modifiers on their card for the round. Unless indicated by these cards, monsters don't attack or move by default. They do have base stats for movement and attack, which may then be modified by their cards. Monsters may also have abilities similar to player characters, as well as their own attack modifier deck, which is shared by all monsters during a scenario. Bosses are larger monster types that are stronger and perform their own special actions. There are also a whole bunch of special attack effects and conditions that will pop up from both players and monsters that I'll rush through for you now. Push and pull effects move your target either closer to you or further away a certain number of spaces. Pierce allows attacks to cut through shields. Add target lets you add an additional target to your attack. Poison means a figure takes an extra damage from any attack. A wound token adds a damage to a figure at the start of each of their turns. Immobilize keeps you from moving. Disarm keeps you from attacking. Stun stops you from doing anything but resting. Muddle gives disadvantage to attacks. Strengthen gives advantage to attacks. Invisible prevents a target from being targeted by any attacks. And Bless and Curse add either positive or negative cards into your modifier deck. Finally, there will be a number of tiles on your map. Doors are flipped open when entered by a character, at which time new enemies and tiles will populate the next room and there may be a flavor text update. Traps cause damage to any figure that enters the same space as them on their turn. Hazardous terrain also causes damage but stays in play whereas traps are removed once triggered. Difficult terrain takes an extra movement point to get through and obstacles simply block movement but not line of sight. If at any point a character's health drops to zero or they are unable to play two cards or rest on their turn, they become exhausted. They're removed from the game and if all players are exhausted, you lose. If you're worried about taking damage, you can instead choose to lose a card from your hand or two cards from your discard pile to negate it. 
Also, certain abilities, items, or resting can help you recover cards from your discard pile, so be sure to manage that carefully along with your health. Once all players and monsters have taken a turn, the round ends. If any cards came out of an attack modifier deck with the shuffle symbol in the corner, those decks are now reshuffled together with their existing discard pile. Some monster cards also feature the shuffle symbol, so look out for it. And elements on the element table get moved one space to the left, cards that were only active for one round are discarded, and players may choose to perform a short rest next. Now. now you can continue and begin a new round until you complete the given requirements of your scenario, such as defeating all of the enemies or defeating a specific enemy. Once completed, calculate your loot money and experience based on the scenario's difficulty level and add it to your character sheet. You'll also have had a secret battle goal card, giving you a unique objective during the scenario. If you manage to complete it along with a scenario, you add check marks to your character sheet, and if you get enough check marks, you're eligible for new perks and upgrades. Get enough experience points and you level up, increase your health and allowing you to add more powerful cards to your arsenal. If you're playing in campaign mode, and you probably are, then in between each scenario you'll head back to Gloomhaven. Here you can buy and sell items to aid you in your quest or donate gold to the sanctuary in exchange for powerful modifier cards for the next scenario. Here you can also complete a city event by drawing a random city event card and following its instructions. Likewise, you'll need to complete a random road event card before leaving Gloomhaven for your next adventure. Throughout the game you'll also be earning achievements, changing your party reputation and altering the town's prosperity as a result of various events and choices which could all affect your game in significant ways. Plus, each player has a personal quest card, a lofty long-time goal they're striving for before they can retire their character and pick a brand new one. Oh yeah, and there are stickers. Did I mention stickers? There's a lot to keep track of and discover in a campaign, so be ready for it. Wow, yeah, I think that... Yeah, I think that's most of it. In conclusion, choose, play, move, attack, loot, level up, and make Gloomhaven great again. That's Gloomhaven in a nutshell. Did you get all that?